Join us right now. Insider covers the Washington football team for NBC Sports Washington. Our pal JP Finley. What's up, JP? Gentlemen, what's going on? Thanks for having me. Hey, of course. Pal. Well, Always. it's interesting. Kind of a split here on the show as to who's going to win this game on Sunday, this NFC East battle. Um, Jason took Dallas in his fatties. Valdez went the other way. I'm kind of inclined to go with Washington. Let's start with why I'm going with Washington. It's because that Dallas offensive line is completely banged up. You can get into that a little further. And there's just been a lot of strife there in Dallas. Yeah, I mean, I think taking either side, you can make a real good case for it. The only thing that makes me nervous taking Washington is a quarterback that turns it over. Yep. And, and I think – the turnover battle is what's going to decide this game because when you have two bad teams, it's who makes the most mistakes. And, and, and I think that's what this will come down to. And the Cowboys O-line is really, really banged up. They're going to be starting a third-string left tackle. And if you're Washington, you hope that Chase Young and John Allen and Montez Sweat and Deron Payne can control the line of scrimmage like they did week one against the Eagles. And uh, if, if that happens, I... I Part of me thinks Washington could run away with it. Like we saw, listen, the Cardinals are way, way, way more explosive, but they were able to kind of do what they wanted against Dallas on Monday night. And I'm not sure that Arizona's that great of a team. I, I think Dallas is bad. I, I think their defense is really, really bad. Their secondary is really, really bad. But if Kyle Allen's giving them the ball, it, it's going to be hard because we've seen Zeke Elliott gash this team before they are a big play offense with the receivers they have and their ability to go downfield and washington's given up a ton of big plays and landon collins and the the back end of that secondary aren't playing well and they're really struggling to stop big plays i don't think the washington's linebackers are good enough um so it, it to me it's going to be Kyle Allen not turning the ball over and if the defensive line can, can control the line of scrimmage. JP, you mentioned turnovers specifically. And, you know, Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio, I'm sure they're not thrilled with being a minus two through six games. But you look all the way at the bottom of the league, and Dallas is a minus 12 in turnover differential. They're yeah. five worse than the Vikings who are at minus seven. So, you know, even though Kyle Allen you know, is prone to give the ball to the other team, Dallas is way worse at it, at least through six games. Zeke Elliott with five fumbles isn't helping. And I, I'm guessing we all watched that game last Monday. And, you know, I mean, he fumbled twice. He's clearly pressing. And I, to me, it seemed pretty obvious he was trying to overcome the lack of Dak Prescott by himself. And that's not going to help. But he's always been, you don't want to say careless, but he's always been a little loose with the football. And I, I think he's so good that he can, you know, believe in his arm strength and just his ability to get through holes it's it's pro football all these guys are gonna kind of take their their swipes and punches at the football and i, and I think you'll see every washington defender doing that uh but it, it's wild that they're turning the ball over at that clip i mean but if you want to just look at the numbers so they're, they're minus 12 in turnover differential, so that's two a game, depending how many you're getting back. But you can roughly look at that as two a game. If you look at Kyle Allen's career numbers, he's got 15 <laughs> starts and 31 turnovers. Two a game. There you go. Yeah, so, I, I mean, it's almost like you wonder, like if you set the turnover battle, just look at the numbers. If you set it at an over-under of four for this game total, would you go over that? I think there's plenty of reason to suggest you should. Yeah, the, the way I look at the game is, look, Dallas is not good. Washington is not good, all right? Um, I just think that Dallas makes enough plays because of their receivers. And you already talked about Landon and uh, DeShazer, I assume, is going to get to start again with them. I just see them getting beat over the top by a couple, you know, by CD or by Gallup or Cooper or any of those guys. Uh, and I think Ezekiel has a much better game. Uh, he's probably been thinking about how bad he played last week for the entire week. So I just think that they make enough plays. I think it's going to be close. And there's going to be a lot of mistakes. Believe me, I don't love betting on Andy Dalton, JP. <laughs> I don't like right. it. But I just think they'll make you, more, play, more look, plays there's than there's no question that Kyle Allen uh, has a history of turnovers. <laughs> but I think the team, I mean, let's just say he can – let's just say he has one. I think he moves – I think the team moves the ball better with him. Um you know, I, th th to me, there's a lot of similarities to our week one game 
against the Eagles where their offensive line was so banged up. I know we don't have Ioannidis, uh, but we certainly do for the defense to kind of step up a little bit and get, and get some pressure. I, I think Washington's got a great shot in this game. Certainly they have a great shot. I mean, they're, they're playing a bad team. They should have a great shot in all of these division games. I think the week one comp is there. It's interesting if they don't get to Andy Dalton a ton, considering how banged up the Cowboys O-line is. That's bad. You, well, you got to wonder how important Ioannidis is to the whole operation. Yeah. I, I mean, he is – I think we can all say undoubtedly that he is their best interior pass rusher. That doesn't mean he's their best interior D lineman, but as a strict pass rusher, I think the sack totals would, would, yeah. would suggest that he, he generates the most pass rush. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, no, no question about it. Hey, JP, can you fill us in on kind of Ron Rivera's messaging this week? Um, some of your brethren there in the media asked him about his inc- inconsistencies. He seemed irritated at first, and then it seems like he's almost acknowledged it, that he goes with his gut a lot, and it might seem inconsistent. What have you heard from Coach Rivera this week? Well, did you see my boy Pete got them all riled up, asking yep. him about a cutoff point for Kyle Allen? Yep. <laughs> um, so, How did he react to that? Because I didn't see it. Oh, he was not pleased. <laughs> <laughs> um, he says he doesn't have a cutoff point. Right. Well, it's tough. I, I, think there's, I think there's a couple things. I think – Ron legitimately doesn't care what like what we the media think of him and the job he's doing but he does care that people understand that he's his big thing is that he's being consistent to the team and that the players on his team understand that every decision he's making is trying to win games and and put them in the best position going forward and and I I think if you asked the players on the team on or off record, they would agree with that. And, and I think you can see a big – I mean, look at what's happening in Dallas with, with the players taking these anonymous shots, like why Jason wants to bet on the Cowboys maybe oh. bouncing back. But clearly they've got some big trouble in, in Dallas, whereas in Washington, even at 1-5 and five and on a five-game losing streak, the team still feels very united. But it's also undeniable that – for a month, we heard about long-term rebuild, and this is going to take a while, and we're going to take our lumps with Dwayne Haskins, and then Dwayne gets benched because we're chasing an NFC East title. There have been contradictory messages. There have been inconsistencies. And, and I think it was smart of Ron to come out yesterday and just say, listen, I've been inconsistent. I, I get it. I'm guilty, but I'm, I'm making every decision I, I can to make my team better and – it's it's with he's he's he told he's told a story about his relationship with John Madden a, a, a few different times about a few different topics, but basically he says that Madden told him to coach by feel because nobody's going to know his team better than he does, and, and that's what Ron says he's doing, and that coaching evolves and the football season evolves and things are going to change over the course of you know four or five months. Can you talk about the receiver situation? Is, is that kid uh, Bedette going to be active this week? What's the story with Steven Sims? Is he anywhere close? Uh, I'm, I can't wait to see Bedette if they activate him, if he gets on the field, because I want to see that speed they're talking about. I, I think you're going to see him. <laughs> um, I was sh- it, it was shocking to be at practice yesterday. They only have five guys going through receiver drills. Wow. A- and, I mean, usually receiver drills, you've got – seven or eight guys running around because you have your five or six that are on the active and then a couple practice squad guys also. I haven't seen Steven Sims in over a week. I, I don't think I've physically seen him out on the field. I don't, I don't want to say that definitively in case he's been on a side field and, and maybe I don't mm-hmm. remember, but I, I don't believe I've seen him. Antonio Gandy-Golden's out for a while. Um, Kelvin Harmon, you can look on Instagram, he, he's – working his way back, but he's not playing this year. Um, they're a mess at wideout. Is frankly. Tony Brown playing? I, I've decided to call him Touchdown Tony Brown. I don't know if that'll work, but it's just such a good <laughs> nickname. Um, yeah, Tony Brown and, and, and Bidette, I, I think, are going to be active for you. How many I, drafted I, guys are going through the drills? So Terry McLaurin was drafted. How many drafted guys are going through the drills? That doesn't sound like many. 
No, because, I mean, Inman's your number two. He's an undrafted guy. Now, he's been in the league six years, but he's still an undrafted guy. Uh, Brown, Bidette. Who, I'm, I'm Cam blank. Sims? Cam Sims. Cam Sims, undrafted. So, yeah. I, I mean. That is so, hold on. So, so, the active receivers, based on what you've seen, are going to be McLaurin, Cam Sims, Inman, Bidette, and Brown? Tony Brown, yeah. Correct. I mean, how are they going to score points? Pickle. I don't know. Oh, how are they score? They're going to throw it to McKissick and Gibson. Well, okay, That's but how... McKiss- McKissick and Gibson can only do so much. Well, those guys can't what? catch. Just throw it to them. I mean, I don't well, know. If the five of us know that, Dallas might know that, too. Yeah, but you know what? It's, like, it's what the Eagles deal with a lot. Yeah, they that's figure true. it out. I mean, but, yeah, they, but don't, they got a better quarterback. They don't have help at tight end either. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, Richard it, Rogers looked pretty good last night in relief. He had yeah, six for eighty-five. He did. That's a cast off from the Washington football team. It's tough because we knew they were struggling at wide out and tight end in July and August, and here we are in October, and it's worse than we thought. I think. I don't think any of us expected the ramifications of the Kelvin Harmon injury to be so significant, but I think they are. I, I think no off season for a guy like Gandy Golden is just a killer mm-hmm. because he's got all the measurables and he's a big, strong kid, but he's still trying to convert from Liberty to the NFL. By the way, hold now on he's dealing second. with an injury. I'm sorry, JP. When did Kelvin Harmon become Jerry Rice? <laughs> Uh, there's so fair. much over talking about Kelvin Harmon. He just came being, on late. Being the That's missing, all. I mean, he's a good player. He's fine, and they got good production out of a relatively late pick. Would you rather have Kelvin Brown or Tony Brown? Kelvin Harmon or Tony Brown? <laughs> I don't know, but I know that there's a lot of over talking about the importance of Kelvin Harmon. In I my mean, opinion, I don't have his numbers right in front of me, but I believe he had like 35 catches last year. This team would love to have a guy capable of 35 catches. I, it's very relative, Cakes. You're right. It's it's a relative situation. But they don't have NFL wideouts. Yeah. They, they just don't. I mean, I, I still can't believe that they gave, they offered a gigantic bag of money to Amari Cooper. He didn't take it, which is probably smart on his part. And then their backup plan was Dontrell Inman? You go from no, no, no. Their Mar- backup plan was the kid who, who's, who's Latimer, the guy from the Giants. Latimer. Latimer. Cody Latimer. That was okay, the well, backup. That's a terrible plan. plan, too. I know. He's done nothing before he came here. <laughs> yeah, well, that's I, a big drop. You know off. who I think, in hindsight, Robbie Anderson. So, Robbie I Anderson played that. for the Jets, you know, put some numbers up with the Jets with terrible quarterbacks. Right. Got kind of, not even second tier, kind of got maybe two, two and a half tier wide receiver money on free agency. And Washington could have afforded him for sure. I, I, I don't believe there was much interest because he's had some interesting off-field issues. Yes. But uh, that guy's balling for Carolina. And he's making, what, $10 million a year? Like you said, that's, that's affordable. That's not Amari Cooper money, but it's still a substantial investment. A, a guy like that would be helping them significantly, oh, would be absolutely. helping Terry significantly, a dependable target for these quarter, young quarterbacks that aren't great. I, I mean, clearly they're going to have to address that position next yeah. season, yeah. Um, tight end as well. So, so Gibson and McKissick are going to get a lot of action just because of what you just talked about. I mean, if Mike Nolan's smart, and I don't know how smart he is or how good a defensive coordinator he is, but he'll do his best to just take McLaurin out of the game and just limit him. Um, but Gibson and McKissick, especially McKissick, I mean, Kyle Allen looked at him a bunch last week. So don't you think that that's going to be the game plan? It's going to be a lot of Gibson and McKissick. Absolutely. I mean, watching Kyle Allen in August in training camp, I I know I've seen this week that there's a lot of folks kind of wondering where the downfield passes are, and I've heard Danny talk about that um, in the midday show a lot, and I don't expect a lot of downfield passes. That guy looks to get the ball out fast, and and part of me thinks that's what Scott Turner and Ron Rivera like, is that he's running the offense and executing, you know, kind of exactly what they want, and the ball comes out quick, but there's not many shots downfield at all, so I I think that bodes well for Gibson and McKissick, and and Mike Nolan might want to shut down Terry McLaurin, but I think that Dallas secondary is so bad, I think Terry's still going to have a big day. Um, So Jason Campbell's on our pre- and post-game shows now, and we did our our, our like planning call for it yesterday, and Campbell was so funny talking about Mike Nolan being back in the NFL. He's like, man, that guy was there when I was there, and the game has evolved so much. Like, are we sure that guy's not the problem with that defense? It was right. uh, it was a pretty interesting comment. From no, he probably got a great point. Yeah. 
talking to J.P. Finley, insider who covers the Washington football team for NBC Sports Washington. Let's get to the other side of the ball. Last week we saw DeShazer Everett in at safety. What did you see in that game from DeShazer? You know, you mentioned Landon Collins. He seems to still be struggling. Um, you talked about the Dallas secondary struggling. Washington's had their issues. They've given up nine plays of 40 yards or more, which was the highest in the league. Um, I mean, think about it. They gave up a 50-yard run to Daniel Jones mm -hmm. last week. I guess, you know, Jones ripped off another long one last night. But they're giving up way too many big plays. You're seeing in that Rams game guys running wide open. Um, I think Everett – it's a small sample because he really only got the one game, but I, I think he's been their best safety so far this year. Right. And I think some of it is maybe Apke, I think, depends, tries to depend on his speed too much and takes bad angles, and we've all noticed that. Um, Landon Collins is taking bad angles, and I, I think Landon Collins is, is maybe thinking too much and should just be reacting more. Um, Landon Collins isn't. I'm not sure Troy Apke's a good player, but Landon Collins is a good player, and I think something's just not going right for him. Because even last season on a, on a bad team, he played significantly better than he is right now. Uh, but DeShazer, DeShazer's a very physical player. Right. Um, I think he kind of really rides that margin of, of being physical and maybe being dangerous. But I think that sets a tone on the back end of a defense. And, um, you know, maybe there will be some penalties. We'll see what happens. But he, he, he's a thumper on the back end. So if you had to go to the betting window, J.P. Finley, and I give you 100 bucks, it's a pick -em game, who are you putting it on? I like the over. Is it still 46? <laughs> I like the over 46. Well, you can do that too, but you got to pick a side. Um, I'm going back and forth a bunch. I think Dallas is too explosive for a defense that gives up big plays. So I, if I, I think you could see 27-26 Dallas, something like that. 